Hi, thanks so much for joining in. This is the Mutual Fund Show on NDTV Profit and I'm Alex Matthew. Often in the construction of your investment portfolio, a lot of attention goes towards choosing the right equity mutual funds and not enough attention is paid to fixed income. The thing is, you can use a fixed income portfolio very effectively, not just to meet your shorter term goals, but also in asset allocation strategy. And in certain situations, you can make a tactical allocation to make significant capital gains. That is what we're going to be talking about on today's program. We'll first talk about the current context and then we'll move to strategy. My first guest is Pankaj Pathak, fund manager and uh, fixed income at Quantum AMC. Thank you so much, Pankaj, for taking the time. Let's uh, set the context for everybody that's tuning in. There's a lot that is happening in the bond markets globally. So as a fund manager, what are the key triggers that you're focusing on, not just in India, but on the global stage? Uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you for having me. Uh, so first of all, uh, last two years, or I would say three years, have been difficult for the fixed income market uh, globally, especially given the inflation, uh, which has spiked after uh, COVID and there, uh, all this geopolitical situation where uh, there's been war between uh, big commodity exporters. And uh, what we saw that globally central banks were hiking interest rates. India too had an inflation of its own and uh, RBA was also hiking interest rate uh, till early part of last year. So last date hike was in February. Uh, so overall, uh, 2022 was very bad. 23, we had a decent year despite all the negative uh, news flows, negative developments on the macro front. But uh, now entering into 24 with a very favorable backdrop. Now the macro backdrop has completely changed. What we see now is that uh, central banks have kind of stopped their uh, rate hiking cycle. Uh, most of them have already indicated that rate hiking cycle is uh, almost done. Uh, and probably they will start rate cutting cycle. So some are uh, explicit about it. Some are not indicating the rate cut. But uh, broadly, we can understand that monetary policy cycle uh, is somewhere around the inflection point where we'll probably see rate cutting uh, start sometime in uh, by, by mid of this year. Uh, Apart from that, we had a big fiscal stimulus after COVID and the lingering effect of that was uh, there in the economy and in the bond demand supply uh, till now. And we, we have some sign of that fading away as uh, uh, government, especially uh, in India, have been consolidating their balance, uh, their, their fiscal uh, balance and uh, also on the demand side, which which has grown and we don't need that kind of RBI support of uh, what we needed this uh, one few years back. So uh, on both the fronts and so domestically inflation, uh, fiscal and the external environment, these are three major drivers and uh, in all the accounts, uh, things are kind of uh, flashing green for now, uh, for, for the bond market, especially for the longer duration bonds, uh, which are more dependent on interest rate cycles and when interest rates move up, they kind of suffer. So last two, three years were bad. Uh, now we have a very favorable backdrop where uh, we'll probably see interest rates coming down uh, this year. And that could be a positive driver for long duration bonds and funds which are investing in uh, in these kind of bond long duration bonds. Okay, so you kind of set the context, but then I also want to delve a little deeper into that last statement that you made, which is about the long-term uh, paper and that being favorable, essentially long-term bonds and duration. Now. Uh, we are at 7.2% on the 10-year tre uh, uh, bond right now, the government benchmark bond. Um, we have, and in several geographies, in several markets, already seen bond yields come off quite substantially. Uh, I think from close to 7.4% levels earlier, uh, we have come down to 7.2% or thereabouts, and we've hovered around this mark. The question is, how much is already being priced in and how much of a downside is possible over the next one, one and a half years, what are your own expectations about the trajectory of the tenure and the longer paper? Yes. Uh, so as I said, we have uh, three major drivers of bond market flashing green. Uh, now, the valuation in the bond market depends a lot on the interest rate cycle. Now, one way of value a bond, especially the long duration bond, is to look at the spread between the 
between the bond yield and the uh, policy repo rate or the uh, overnight funding rate, etc. So uh, just to compare between the repo rate, which is at six and a half, and the ten-year bond yield, which is around seven point two percent, the spread is around seventy basis points. Uh, one would argue that this spread is below its long-term average. If you take, uh, say, 10, 20-year average, you will probably find uh, the spread between the 10-year GSEC and and the uh, repo rate somewhere around 100 basis points. Uh, but when you just look at the cycles where uh, interest rates are in a declining phase or interest rate cycles have peaked, uh, most of the cases you find this, this spread between the 10-year GSEC and the and the repo rate uh, much narrower, somewhere around uh, 30 to 40 basis points. So there is a strong case for uh, the spread between the long-term bond and the repo rate to this. That's one. Secondly, uh, we have seen inflation coming down sharply. Uh, means the headline numbers uh, might overestimate because of the vegetable price cycles uh, that has been distorted. Uh, we have not seen that kind of drop what we usually see in December. And there has been uh, some spike in different vegetables from time to time uh, that kind of distorted the inflation cycle. But if you look at the underlying inflation trend, uh, ignore the volatile vegetable prices, or just for uh, sake of ease, we look at the core inflation, which is uh, which includes uh, the, the uh, food and fuel prices that has come below 4% recently. And if you uh, look at the momentum, which is month on month, how it's going on month on ba month basis, and try to analyze that, uh, probably we'll see core inflation falling somewhere close to three and a half percent in the next few months. So uh, there is also a case for rate cut. Uh, some of the MPC members uh, have already indicated that uh, rates can be cut. There is a room to cut. Uh, probably we'll see this debate uh, getting more intense uh, in the next few monetary policies and. Uh, so if, if suppose there is a rate cut, uh, that will be an added uh, layer where uh, you, can, you can see further declining bond yields. So my, my sense is that uh, there is enough room. Uh, it's not entirely priced. Uh, market is not pricing that much of interest rate uh, in Indian context. Uh, uh, so so uh, we'll probably see Indian yields going down. To what extent? And, uh, so so, no, so the question was to what extent? So we, we're at 7.2%. <laughs> And I know that I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, Pankaj, but in 2024, in your base case assumption, how far do you think on the downside can the yields move on the tenure? Yeah. So, uh, uh, again, I think there, there are many moving parts and that's why I'm not putting any number. <laughs> I'm not kind of, uh, I'll resist that. Uh, but uh, another point I would make and, uh, uh, is that on the demand supply side, also we have a very favorable outlook. Sure. So I would be surprised if uh, the spread between the long-term bonds and the repo rate fall to a lower le uh, level of their band. So maybe somewhere around 25 to 30 basis points uh, over the repo rate. And in this case, I would take a forward-looking repo rate uh, maybe towards the end of this uh, this year. So so rates could be uh, can miss the, the yields can fall uh, uh, substantially from current level, maybe around six and a half kind of level. Uh, in in next few months, so seventy basis. But again, points. I think there uh, I, I, there are a lot of uncertainties. There are a lot of moving parts. So I think anybody <laughs> taking that a uh, number as a uh, focal Basically. point, yeah. they, they, they should be uh, looking at the entire situation as a whole. No, so that makes entire sense, and and you ca you have to caveat that. That's a, an important yeah, yeah, yeah. caveat to make. Um, but having said that, uh, in terms of strategy, uh, and and this, uh, so I, I'm trying to give my viewers some actionable insight as well. Uh, and I'm hoping that they will get that from uh, what you're saying in terms of your strategy right now. How are you constructing your actively managed bond portfolios? Uh, and, uh, you know, what level of the, what point of the yield are you focusing on? Or what point of the duration are you focusing on at this stage? Uh, so we, we have been bullish on the fixed income market for best part of, uh, last year, and uh, we still retain our uh, positive outlook, as I mentioned. And with that view, we we have been in the longer segment, mostly positioned in the uh, 10 to 15 year segment. Bulk of our position is in our actively managed fund. Uh, we we have bulk of our position in uh, that that category uh, between 10 to 15 year government bonds.
Okay. Fantastic. So, thanks so much for joining in and giving us the perspective that you did uh, give us. And uh, pleasure speaking with you, Pankaj, on this program. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. All right. So, um, it's uh, important to point out that it's not the easiest subject to understand, bond markets. But the crux of what Pankaj was just talking about is that bond yields from this juncture are likely to head down. And what that means is that if you are invested in longer duration funds, the potential for capital gains exists right now if you are indeed taking a tactical bet on that. But then fixed income as a strategy is used for much more than just a tactical bet. And we'll talk about how you should fine tune your strategy in the new year. Joining me after this very short break, we've got uh, Prableen Bajpai of FinFix Research as well as Mani Karan Singhal uh, of uh, Good Moneying Wealth Planners. Thank so we'll have that conversation lined up for you in just a short while. Do stay tuned. And this is NDTV Profit. Welcome back. You're watching the Mutual Fund Show and we're having a conversation about fixed income strategy. Joining me, as I said, to talk to you about how you should fine tune your strategy is Prableen Bajpai as well as Manikaran Singhal. Thank you so much to the both of you for taking the time and speaking to NDTV Profit. I will start with you, Prableen, just to set the context. We've spoken about how fund managers are approaching the bond markets right now. But how should individuals ideally look at fixed income as part of their overall strategy? Uh, good afternoon, Alex. Great to be on your show. 
uh, I think fixed income is actually the backbone of uh, any portfolio. And as Indians, I think we all uh, have always loved fixed income products, be it the post office schemes or the bank FDs, uh, your EPFs, uh, public provident fund. And I think uh, debt funds within the fixed income basket are still the underutilized uh, you know, component. But I think they play a very, very important role. And uh, uh, beat different time horizons, beat your near-term goals to medium-term to long-term goals, I think there is uh, you know some element of fixed income which should be there. And I think debt funds are there available for each of these different horizons. And uh, they bring with them multiple benefits. Uh, and I think it's a... A uh, slightly uh, lesser understood category as well, the overall space of debt funds. And I think uh, uh, at this point in time, uh, like you discussed with Pankaj, I think the long duration funds definitely are looking great. And uh, people with long term horizons, uh, you know, they have the passive strategies as well available for them within the debt space. So I think that definitely looks good. And uh, there is a uh, scope for additional, uh, you know, little returns there as well. Uh, as we move towards the interest rate cut cycle going forward. Fantastic. So we'll talk about tactical allocations as well. But uh, traditionally, uh, and this one's for you, Manikaran, we've looked at fixed income because of the ability to protect uh, capital as a, a, a method or a vehicle to achieve shorter term goals. So we don't say uh, invest in equity if you have a goal that is in the next one and a half, two years, right? So you go towards fixed income because you're uh, protecting your capital. Does that still hold true in the mutual fund space, though, considering that the tax laws have changed? Okay. Hi, Alex. Uh, thank you for having me on your show. Uh, so, uh, like you said, uh, like Pankaj was uh, discussing that the bond cycle is too complicated to understand, the same way I would say the investor behavior is again more complicated to understand, more complicated than the bond market. I mean, the just because of tax efficiency, we are talking about debt fund, short term and medium term kind of usability, but the usability has not changed at all. Even the, the tax rules has changed for the long term uh, capital gain tax, but for the short term, it is still the same. So taxation has not changed, but the usability uh, is definitely uh, looked into. And uh, that mutual fund is still a good tool to build and maintain discipline as far as the medium term and uh, short term goals are concerned. Like business accounts definitely uh, uh, make use of the debt mutual funds because in the current account there is no uh, no interest they will receive. Uh, but in the in the in the debt mutual funds in the short term mutual fund they do earn something. It is used for the short term parking of the fund and for the investment point of view also. Even if you want to average out the market. So the rebalancing of asset allocation from STP point of view, systematic transfer plan, and from the rebalancing of asset allocation, if the market is going good and you want to cut down the equity exposure and be again into the debt fund, uh, into the debt market, it's easy for you to move between the mutual funds rather than uh, moving between the other traditional deposits like fixed deposits or post office schemes. That's so it is still, uh, it still hold true. Yeah, and, and, and I think what I take from that is also, if you look at fixed income mutual funds versus fixed deposits, that deferment of gains uh, and the deferment, therefore, of the taxation is an important aspect to bear in mind as well, right? But yes. uh, off late, Prableen, this has entered the conversation because of that change in the, uh, in the taxation norms. There has been a conversation about using hybrid strategies that have a significant allocation towards fixed income, uh, but have equity-like uh, taxation because of the construction of their portfolio. Is this the right comparison to make, though? Because you still have a sizable equity uh, exposure in that uh, hybrid fund. Uh, so within the hybrid uh, space, Alex, we have three, uh, six different uh, kinds of uh, you know, uh, options available to us. And a few of them still have the debt taxation. Some of them will have the debt with indexation taxation. And of course, some of them bring the taxation benefit for equities. So uh, broadly, which uh, particular category are we picking from within the debt space? Uh, that is very important. Because, uh, for example, if we are looking at a person who has been investing in the fixed income and we are looking at an alternative from the hybrid basket, uh, you know, we can't go beyond a small percentage in uh, equities because that would also change the risk profile uh, of that product uh, drastically. So uh, I think uh, it's so important when we're looking at the hybrids, uh, you know, we actually know uh, what is the 
uh, risk appetite of the investor, the ideal horizon, uh, that has to be known in advance. And then accordingly, I think the right hybrid fund can be picked. But definitely hybrid funds, I think, are a great fit for any investor's portfolio, given the variety that they offer, starting from the arbitrage funds, uh, which are low risk and yet offer the equity benefit from parking uh, point of view to uh, multi-asset funds, uh, to balanced advantage funds. Uh, but again, uh, which uh, subcategory from within this broader hybrid uh, space, I think uh, will depend on uh, individual uh, investors' requirements and his profile. Okay, fair point. Manikaran, do you want to add to this? Because I think a lot of important points were made there. Uh, I, I, I've heard it said and I think rightly so also, that hybrid funds don't remove the need for asset allocation strategy. They don't fix that problem for you. So it needs to fit somewhere in your in your portfolio. And I think what you said at the start as well makes sense in this argument as well of fixed income, pure fixed income versus hybrid, which is don't make it a decision just because of the tax laws. How do you uh, advise people to go about uh, whether going for hybrid or going for fixed income? See, Alex, uh, the tax laws has changed not only for the debt funds, but these are for the uh, non-equity category funds, right? So even the gold funds fall, yeah. fall into this, the international taxation funds fall into this. So if we if we try to get into the hybrid category, then we'll definitely lose on the asset allocation part and the diversification part, which has uh, many advantages just if we ignore the tax tax aspect into it. Simply, if you want to have the tax benefit, you have to add on equity. And the more you add on equity, the more you add on the volatility part of the portfolio. And the investors these days, I would say the investors who's been investing for the last 10 years or 15 years has actually not seen the slowdown yet. And they don't know, they don't understand that what the beer market may, come, may bring their for in, uh, into their portfolio. They need to understand the what risk that equity, I mean, definitely equity comes with the growth and it's a long-term portfolio. But everybody just from the taxation point of view can't design a portfolio like that. One has to be wary of the risk. And what if the three year, five year slowdown may come in front of them and how will the portfolio like and how will they behave at that point in time? What would the status of the goals? Will they achieve that or not? I mean, taxation should be secondary. I mean, these asset, asset allocation and the basic financial hygiene should be the primary aspect of designing a portfolio. Okay, fair point. Uh, Prabhleen, you were talking about the uh, potential for a tactical allocation towards fixed income. Uh, and now, I, I think there are a few thumb rules that can help people understand the potential for gains. And I, I'm saying thumb rule because I, I'll go back to the original point, which is that this is not a very well understood category. When bond yields fall to a certain extent, there is potential for capital gain. When bond yields rise to a certain extent, there's pot potential for capital loss. So you don't necessarily always protect your capital in a fixed income fund. How would you explain that, one? And what should you bear in mind in this current scenario when you're talking about bond yields at a certain level and the potential for a cut of 200 to 250 basis points in, a, in an interest rate cycle, which can go anywhere between one year to three years. Uh, what is the potential for gain for capital? Right. Uh, Alex, you know, uh, we often say that uh, don't look at the past returns while investing. And I think that is even more important when we are talking about debt funds. So I'll just go back a little. Uh, you know, during the COVID period, we saw drastic uh, uh, deductions in the interest rates. And uh, what was happening was that at that time, uh, suddenly the long duration funds, you know, where investors had invested earlier started looking so good. And we were even looking at double digit returns at that time. And People really wanted to go and invest. In fact, the inflows had increased in guild funds, long duration funds, because everybody was chasing those 11, 12, 13 percent returns, which started to show because of the drastic uh, reduction in the interest rates. Uh, so first thing that, you know, never look at the past returns, especially in the debt segment. Uh, now, you know, answering your question about uh, what kind of returns or, you know, return potential can we see? So uh, I think we've been saying this for the last almost a year, a year and a half now that, you know, uh, we are at a time where globally we've seen the interest rates going higher and higher and uh, the yields were looking good. So if you were invested and you already, you know, parked your money and uh, let's say six months from now or three quarters from now, we uh, see an interest rate cut. That is the time when, depending on what is the duration of the debt fund that you're holding, you will see a positive uh, impact on the NAV. 
uh, uh, so I'll give you a simple explanation here. Uh, there is something called the modified duration of every debt fund. So for a layperson to understand uh, uh, what they can look at is the modified duration of their scheme. So let's say the modified duration of a particular scheme is four years and we see a interest rate cut by about 1%. That will positively impact the NAV of that scheme by 4%. And the opposite happens if there is an interest rate hike. So for example, if there is an hike by 1%, then there will be an impact negative 4% on the NAV. So definitely uh, at the point where we are, uh, as on date, you know, interest rates have almost peaked. If we are looking at a deduction uh, going forward, I think it's a good time if investors actually genuinely, you know, there is a need for a long duration debt fund in their portfolios, they can actually look at parking. And I think some of the wonderful passive products are there, which even have maturities of 2028, 20, 2030, 20, 30, 33. Uh, that is definitely something they can look at. But uh, if the modified duration of your particular scheme is um, not too uh, much, let's say it's six months or one year, then definitely the impact of rise or fall in interest rates is uh, always lesser. And that is why it's advised when we are looking towards the hike in the interest rates, you you know park your money in debt funds where the durations are not too uh, long. And uh, at times when you're looking at deductions, that is the time when you should be parking your money in longer duration products. But, uh, but Alex, ultimately, it must suit the overall, I think, profile and portfolio of the investor because making tactical calls in the debt space uh, can be a very, very tricky bet as well. Absolutely. And very well put. Thank you so much for breaking that down. And I, I will take the liberty of saying that target maturity funds are essentially what you were talking yes. about. And yes. we will talk about various options down the line as well. But uh, Prabhleen as well as Manikaran, thank you so much for joining in and for speaking to us on NDTV Profit. Viewers, there you have it. That is a conversation about fixed income products and fixed income strategy. You see the number at the bottom of your screen. If you've got specific questions about mutual funds, don't hesitate to send it to us and we'll answer it over the course of the coming week. Do stay tuned. This is NDTV Profit.